Hi, everybody. So uh, today is the last in our seven part series. What does God call us to do as church? What does God call us to do as church? So um, this is a prayerful question, right? What does God call us to do as church? It's a spiritual question. So let's just take a moment to rest with that question in our mind and in our heart and in our bodies. And you might just say that question over to yourself in your mind as you rest in this moment of silence. The basic question that remains from last week is, does politics belong in church? Which I, it could be like a years long yeah. exploration that we're gonna do in about 10 minutes. Hot and, buttons are discussed in 10 minutes, right? You're right. To those. So do politics belong in church? Most people would say no, right? It's like, I don't go to church for that. <laughs> I wouldn't say most people, a lot of, as a pastor, I've heard that a lot over the years. <laughs> keep, keep the news out of the church. Keep, you know, anything on the news. I don't need the news. I can get the news all the other time. I don't need to go to church to get the news. I don't need to go to church to hear political opinions and so on. You hear that a lot. But I think it's helpful on this issue to really have a precise understanding of what we mean by the word politics. Okay. The reason nobody wants to hear politics in church is because the word itself is, is disgusting. <laughs> it, it, it has it negative connotations, to say the least. Is that fair? <laughs> so uh, dirty, nasty, ugly. Um, this particular PowerPoint template only allowed for three words here. I would add a fourth one if it allowed a fourth one, and that is divisive. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, polarizing, yeah. divisive. But okay. isn't it? Pardon me for a yeah. minute. But isn't it ironic that the word, if something is politic, it means that it is amenable to discussion and peaceful in training. <laughs> yeah, I have not thought about that use of the word politic. And obviously, they're related, right? Mm -hmm. I did not do a study of the word politics or politic, but I think it has to do somehow with the management of the household. Right? And I've got a definition here coming up that I think makes politics in, in church a more palatable, a more politic there you go. Uh, concept. Here's a quote by somebody, politics is a dirty business, but if you do not do politics, politics will be done too. Oh, that's a little bit. I can't see who did that. So I found this little definition of politics in the upper left-hand corner, the way people living in groups make decisions. Politics is inevitable in business, in families, in communities, nation and in the church it's about power you know who's going to decide what are they going to decide who gets a voice whose voice is neglected it's about all those things do we go this way do we go that way i'd like to suggest two broad definitions of the word politics one is issue politics which focuses on public policy and what we've talked about the last two weeks plus is the church can be a place where we discuss public policy. In that sense, politics is gonna be a part of church. So if a pastor mentions gun violence in a sermon, if a pastor mentions voting rights in a sermon, that's public policy and it's politics. I, I, I'm not sure I can agree with that. To me, that is the news of the day. It's it's it is the world we're living in. Yep. It has nothing to do with with what we uh, you know how we would vote about that. Right. right. It's it's so it's the world we are living in right now. It, whether it's whether it's the, the gun business or or tornadoes. Yep. Or or what is it? All all these things are occurring. In, in uh, it, to me, it's a little bit separate from uh, going beyond that. So if public policy doesn't resonate with you, how about just social concerns, social issues? Certain mm -hmm. matters, matters in the world. Um, I just looked this up. Colette 
political is an ancient Greek word used in Greek political thought, especially that of Plato and Aristotle, derived from the word polis, city state. It's a range of meanings from the rights of citizens to a form of government. Thank you. So that's interesting in terms of the rights of citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, church members are citizens too, right? Mm -hmm. So we we always wear the hats of people of faith and uh, people who are, we're in our world, whether we consider ourselves political or not. And as so many people have noticed, uh, have, have noted to, to think that you're apolitical is a lot of people say I'm apolitical, I'm not interested in politics, I don't do politics, et cetera. But by not doing politics, you're allowing the status quo, right? You're supporting the status quo, right? Mm -hmm. So apolitical, in my own mind, there's no such thing, right? We are all political, not acting is acting, not speaking is speaking, so. So I'd like to narrow in here on the kind of politics that is, for one thing, not allowed by the Johnson Amendment, but is also a little more questionable as to whether houses of faith should get involved in. And that's electoral politics. Specifically, that's elections candidates and the political parties. Narrowing down even further would be partisan politics, where an organization or in individuals in an organization would actually promote a particular candidate or party. So in community organizing, there's a distinction between political and partisan. Those are the two big distinctions, mm -hmm. political and partisan. Mm -hmm. Political is getting involved in the social issues of the day, getting informed, maybe even taking a stand, learning about it, learning about why it's a moral issue if it's a church, synagogue, or mosque. Partisan politics is vote straight, Republican, um, you know, vote for the Bush of your choice, as Jerry Falwell said. <laughs> <laughs> That's partisan versus political. Now, again, people hear social issues, though, in a church, synagogue, or mosque, and they say that's politics. And that's why I think it's helpful to distinguish the word politics in some different ways. <clears throat> so, again, politics versus partisan. Uh, Yes, it's politics that must be admitted up front if the church is involved in social justice. Mm -hmm. You need to just be honest. That to talk about gun violence, LGBTQ issues, anti-racism, this is politics. It's in the news. These are matters before town councils, uh, school boards, state legislatures, Congress, et cetera. Uh, to say this isn't politics is really not fair. I think you need to give ground on that and just say, yeah, it's politics, but let me define politics. So, so, um, so if politics is the way that people living together make decisions, then yes, it's politics, but it's not electoral politics, but you can also call it issue politics because addressing social concerns does get the church involved in specific issues and policies. Now, is it partisan? No. Church involvement in social justice is not partisan or electoral politics. The goal of the church, synagogue, mosque getting involved in social issues is the end result of public policy that promotes the reign of God, the way of peace and justice in the world, not the promotion of particular candidates and parties. Now, it does sometimes seem that a church, synagogue, or mosque their positions might align with a certain candidate or a certain party. But that doesn't mean that you have sold out to that party or, or politician. In fact, it's more helpful, in my humble opinion, if the church maintain a kind of healthy independence, a kind of willingness to affiliate with you on this, but not on something else. Willing to affiliate with another person of a different party on something else, but not this. That gives the church, synagogue, or mosque the power to be independent <clears throat> of those parties <throat> and politicians. Because once you, once you say, I'm for everything you're for, you have given them power over your decisions. Yeah. 
that's not probably a good idea. All right. How do church members feel about their church getting involved in social justice? Well, <laughs> there's probably a wide range of responses. Yes. That, that's an important issue. It is very important. Mm -hmm. And it's my experience in my last two churches that some people got a little concerned. About, I think it was a year ago, January, there was an article uh, in the Wall Street Journal beginning on the front page about a church in Michigan who decided to, uh, to study social issues, uh, political issues by the moment. And they formed a group, a committee, and everybody was given a notebook. And, uh, and they noted down both sides of each issue uh, in this notebook. And, and they, they did research and they went out and found uh, you know, concrete evidence on different sides. But uh, I did send the article to you, but I think it ended up somewhere on somebody else's desk. But it was to the whole. <laughs> yeah, I'm not recalling that. But uh, yeah, you probably did see it. But so it has been done, and I thought sure. it was interesting that the Wall Street Journal did bring it to yeah. everybody's attention. Well, I, I grew up United Methodist, and one of the things we studied in sixth grade, in my sixth grade Sunday school class, was the United Methodist Church's stands on issues of the day. Mm -hmm. There was a book. Mm -hmm. A book from the General Conference is how that's how the Methodist Church works. Janet and I grew up at Grace United Methodist Church, Decatur, Illinois, 901 North Main Street. And <laughs> <laughs> that was something our sixth grade Sunday school teacher wanted us to read and study and talk about. So, my whole life, I've kind of grown up assuming that churches should be concerned about social issues. But as a pastor, I found that there are various responses. <laughs> To this. So my question, one of my questions for us to consider is, are these various responses reason to stop the church from engaging in ministries of social justice? Uh, because some people do get a little uh, anxious or even a lot anxious. Do you cater to them alone and say, oh, you're right, you're right, we're, we'll, we'll, we'll not do that. I remember there was a huge gathering. Tom Kytus was in charge. Then New York had just been attacked. The buildings are down. And we are going to war because we're going to war. And so the congregation was there. And somebody in the back started screaming about, not screaming, but, you know, you're wrong, Tom. Tom is mm -hmm. against the war. I know, Tom. I know, but... And so this this guy wasn't. He thought this was a great idea. Yeah. And Tom just stood his ground and he said, "I didn't know I was standing in a church where I couldn't give my opinion." Some <laughs> some comment like that. Anybody yeah, that. that. I just wanted to remind you. So on issues of war and peace, on poverty and criminal justice, I mean, emotions are not far from the surface. This needs to be admitted. Mm -hmm. Should this church, any church, want to move in this direction, you just need to uh, <clears throat> strap in and get ready because people will have their responses. Yeah. How would you church? say that within uh, your realm of knowledge, are churches more or less likely to put their foot into something of this nature? Oh, less likely. Oh, yes. Less likely because the traditional the traditional approach of churches in responding to the problems of the world has, has been ministries of charity, which we've studied the last few weeks well, all along. Mm -hmm. Ministries of charity. So let's help people by giving them things and sort of empowering them, sort of, rather well, than I looking at justice, which is social change. Mm -hmm. Social change just, that prevents the need for social for ministries of it charity. It seems to me justice and justice itself empowers. Them. So mm -hmm. if you support justice. Right. It should lift the tide for all boats. Uh -huh. right? yes. So yeah. we don't have a lot of time on this, but my experience as a pastor is when people start to get, um, start to question the church's involvement in social concerns, the way to respond is through caring conversations. Mm -hmm. Give everybody a chance to speak their mind. Mm 
And sometimes you need to kind of go back to the beginning. Like, why are we doing this? You know, like this series is addressed. Do you think that? All right. Yeah. I just want to make a comment. Do you think it would be helpful for people? I think maybe a lot of people don't understand how how Jesus was so um, so much involved in social justice. Yeah. I mean, how much he supported that. I, I I mean, I don't think that a lot of people are truly aware of his sure. subversive nature in a sense. In a sense. Right. Yeah. And so progressive Protestant churches often teach this, preach it. But still, people think about Jesus more as a spiritual figure mm -hmm. and a person who healed and so on, but not someone who confronted the powers that be. Yes, John, and then I, I we're going to try to make our way I, I, through. Sim similar, similar thinking. And that, <clears throat> uh, the, re the reason Jesus was crucified, uh, in, in my humble, I, I have a hum humble opinion also. I, my, <laughs> my, opinion, my humble opinion is just as humble as yours. <laughs> uh, Jesus, when Jesus uh, uh, knocked down the, the, uh, the, ta the tables of the, of the money changers, that was an act of justice. He was he was pissed because they were they were making they were making fun of the of the of the religious establishment, or the, uh, uh, and he was he was he was against it because. It, it was an in, insult to, to God and, and the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, uh, the organization, the, the religious organization, which was tied up with the, with the, with the Romans, uh, was not pleased because uh, he, was, he was attacking uh, a symbol of the, the control of the establishment that was there. That's right. The religious and political establishment, yeah, which were yeah. the same thing. Yeah, to me, that's why he got crucified. Yeah, it wasn't, wasn't for the sins of the world. It was because, so, because uh, you, you, you can action. say that in a progressive Protestant yeah. church, and it said a lot, um, because our church is a little bit different in that way. But still, the default for a lot of Christians, including Christians sitting in the pews of mainline Protestant churches, is Jesus died for my sins so that when I die, I'll go to heaven. So there is that tension. <laughs> if you are wondering, how does a church decide what issues to work on? At St. John in Arlington Heights, uh, we had a system to do that. So that congregation worked with the Community Renewal Society and dozens of other synagogues, mosques, churches around the Chicago area. They formulated a platform over the summer. All these churches together, formulated a social justice platform. Usually there were four or five planks. Then in August, we would bring this platform to the congregation for an open conversation. Like, what do you feel, a prayerful conversation, like what do you feel led to? What are, what are the, we probably can't do all these things, but what are two or three that you think that our church is really, what we're really about as a congregation that affect our neighborhood, or that affect our hearts, that we could really get support from. So we would usually let two or three of those planks go, and we would really focus on one or two of them. And we would, our own team that I outlined last week, the team and the groups and so on, would get to work on it. Um, so to bring it back to a specific example, you may be aware that the Attorney General in the state of Texas has made a ruling that parents of uh, transgender children who decide to embark on gender affirming treatment for their children can be investigated for child abuse. Yeah. yeah. Alabama also, um, it's spreading. The governor then in Texas has taken the ruling or opinion of the attorney general and instructed all the other agencies of the state to go forth and implement it. Yeah. Now, so let's pretend that we're not in Winneka or Illinois, and let's pretend that we are an LGBTQ plus affirming congregation in Texas. Do we sit on our hands and say, well, that's politics. That's a nasty business. Or do we say we are by faith an LGBTQ plus affirming congregation. We cannot sit on our hands. And so we go to our state reps and we go to our communities, to the newspapers, 
We speak, we act. This is not a far-fetched. Um, it's a very real world <laughs> example, I think, except we don't have to do tests. Yeah. I think the critical part of that would be is finding enough other churches that feel the same way rather yeah. than standing alone, because you could be crucified standing alone, I think. Right. So there's, as we studied last week, there's the, the point of community organizing is there's power in numbers. Mm -hmm. Numbers of people, numbers of institutions. The more people, the more institutions, the more power. But you can imagine that the temperament of what we hear about churches being attacked under all, if a church stands up and is voluble, even politely, about their defense of people who are LGBTQ, somebody could come in with a gun and <laughs> So there's there's fear of that risk. Yes, because um, everybody's armed and protected. Yeah. Um, hi, Kirsten. Hi, Just sorry. To, on the issue of LGBTQ plus affirmation, I've served churches that said, "Well, we don't want to do that because then people will think of us as the gay church." So you get a lot of opinions about social issues in churches. So you can understand how some people may say, "Oh, let's just." Stick with the spiritual Jesus. That's mm -hmm. not easy. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Mm -hmm. We have a collective voice. We have a collective power. Shall we use them to affect systemic and structural change? That's, that's yeah. really an issue, I think. Um, I'm going to quickly go through each of the six weeks. The reason we're talking about this is this question of what, how do we how do we expand our mission work at Winneka Congregational Church to be more effective? This is just keeps bubbling up um, in a lot of the committees and council. <clears throat> and I kept raising my hand like, I have an idea. I have an idea. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> We have these, this series came from that, um, as well as our burgeoning partnership with Bethel Baptist Church in Chicago Heights. And it was also mentioned last spring when we were putting our plans together uh, for this year. Um, and the question was framed from the very beginning last summer. What, uh, what does God call us to do as a church? corporate body. Um, and the purpose has been education, not decision making. We're not a decision making body. And that same week, uh, we started talking about uh, ethics in the Hebrew Bible. And it's hard to, to be really to get one clear ethical perspective from the Hebrew Bible. It's such a vast range of literature. But one point is it, it has so many different opinions about ethics that one thing is it's an ethical document. The Old Testament is all about right and wrong and what we should do together. The community aspect becomes very clear. In fact, the stories about Cain and Abel, the Exodus are told in part, not only to talk about God, but in light of God's love for humanity and God's character is just. What are we, the covenant community, who exist because of God and are called to live in God's nature and presence. How are we together to make decisions about how to, how to witness to this great love? It's, it's communal in other words. There's Chevy Chase down there. If you want maybe a, <laughs> a summary of ethics in the Hebrew Bible, it might be found best in the prophets, of course who were always speaking about defending the most vulnerable in society. Specifically, the orphan, the widow, and the foreigner. That gets repeated a lot. The orphan, the widow, and the stranger or the foreigner. <clears throat> Another slightly later uh, Hebrew summary of ethics is in the phrase tikkun olam, to repair the world. If you go to any reformed synagogue, you'll hear the rabbi talking a lot about that phrase, tikkun olam, 
to repair the world. If you want to know what, what, we're, what, what are we all about? To repair the world. It's a beautiful, beautiful period. Mm -hmm. It's not in the Bible, sadly, but it's in the it's in the uh, the rabbis just after the close of the Hebrew canon, sometime between 400 and BC and 200 AD. Jesus might have known this phrase. Why didn't you say it to me? <laughs> uh, the week after that, March 6th, talk about Jesus in the New Testament, highlighting in part about ministries of charity that Jesus did, ministering one-on-one -on -one with people who were victims of the system, and also, as John described so well, John, uh, Jesus was fairly uh, aggressive, assertive, in speaking truth to power, to both the temple elites and indirectly, at least, to Rome. Church history on March 13th, uh, a good example of how the church has been involved in social issues it goes back to the 19th century. <clears throat> it's very consistent with witness. That is, churches in the north, quite frankly. Not all. Some were saying that's politics. <laughs> Don't want to get involved in politics. But many congregational and Presbyterian and Quaker and Quaker. Unitarian churches got involved in the anti-slavery movement. And their preachers preached about it. And some of them faced pushback from their communities. But uh, there was somewhat of a consistent message against slavery, leading all the way up to the civil rights movement. Um, if there had been no involvement in churches, progressive churches in the North, African-American churches in the South, I don't think there would have been a civil rights movement. And uh, today, churches get involved in both um, ministries of charity and ministries of justice. We paused on March 20th just to ask what are the needs of our world and community today? It's a rather long list. And hit the, this distinction and relationship between charity and justice pretty hard on the 27th. That's a summary of that. I gave the example that day of the church in Arlington Heights taking on the issue of, which we did with lots of churches, seeing if we could help ex-offenders get employment and housing by helping them seal their criminal records if they were uh, guilty of low-level, non-violent felonies. Those records would be sealed from everybody except financial institutions and police departments. And we were successful because in part, we went to one of our Republican state reps, uh, Tom Morrison from Palatine, and we pleaded to him based on his faith as an evangelical Christian who believed in redemption and second chances and forgiveness and his own personal story that he revealed to us that day that his own company had to fire a worker that they loved because their insurance company found out that she had been guilty, had, had uh, been found guilty of a, a felony crime. And he said, but she was such a good worker, she deserved a second chance. She said, and he said, let me look at this bill. And he looked at it, he notified us, he said he would support it and become a co-sponsor and ask other Republican colleagues to join him, which they did. Not all of them, some of them did. And the bill passed and was signed by Governor Quinn. Last week, we had a way too ambitious agenda on all these things, including separation of church and state, and also how a local church can actually do social justice ministries. What does the Constitution say? Um, we talked about how important it is to build coalitions, not only with other houses of worship, but <clears throat> anybody you can build a coalition with on the issues that you want to, to address. And I didn't mention last week, I added to the slide just yesterday, this church does have this partnership with Bethel Baptist Church. There's all kinds of possibilities there for partnering together on ministries of charity and justice. And remember when Pastor Blackfold and Pastor Jeff met, it was at an event to bring churches together around the issue of gun violence. 
And Jeff, through the spirit, had this vision of a partnership between our two churches that might, down the road at some point, address not just get to know you and be nice to each other, which is great, <laughs> but actually do something together, do something important together. And he had in, in mind at that time gun violence. I, I remember clearly. I wrote these questions down so we could keep them before us while we look at our friends on screen. But, uh, looking at them together, our framing question is, what does God call us to do together? And I'd like you to tell me over the last seven weeks, what have you heard? What's new? What's exciting? What's confounding? I like that. You don't get it. <laughs> it's okay. I won't, I won't take it. any umbrage at any responses you have. Uh, what's disturbing? What's challenging? A few of us have joined with a, a prayer partner from Bethel Baptist. And for me, it I just feel like I'm the perfect person, or I don't know that anyone knew who was going to get with who, but... Um, we talk on the phone for about an hour every Friday morning at 10 o'clock. And this last time she was a little bit late and she said, I'm calling because I'm working in our, they call it an indoor garage sale, but it was a, like a church rummage sale. And she said, I've been, you know, cleaning and putting things up and all of this, but I didn't want to miss our meeting. And so we talked then, not maybe as long as usual, but we take turns uh, writing a prayer for the end of each one of our sessions. Uh, she's delightful. We have a lot of things in common, it turns out. And her husband was a graphic artist and she's been into art things. And we just have made such a nice connection and we would hope that we could meet each other at some time. Um, but uh, I just think it's been wonderful for me anyway. And I think it was a small group only that signed up to do this with someone from down there. And um, as far as I know, it's worked out very well. Thank you, Betty. Yeah, so as we learned last week, uh, Saul Alinsky's whole theory about social uh, community organizing is based on relationship. I may not go to that meeting by myself, but if my friend is going, we'll go together. If my friend really wants me to go, okay, I'll go. <laughs> then you get there and you, like your eyes are opened and you feel energized to do the next thing what Betty talks about is this Zoom is a chance in the future for people to you know get together with Bethel Community Church what, I mean how do you do that but Zoom is a great instrument yeah we have technology today we didn't have well, we had between the two of us my, my new friend and I had talked about the fact that we didn't know what each other looked like. And um, I said, it's too bad we can't do Zoom. And she said, well, somebody told me once how to do it, but I'm gonna have to try to figure it out. Uh, so I don't know if we'll get to that, but we have decided that as soon as the, the virus is gone and all of that kind of thing, that we can maybe even meet halfway. She is out in the, well, let's see. Um, I forget what town she's from, but, um, she said she'd even be glad to drive up here for a visit. So I think at some point we'll see each other. <laughs> Great. I might add that the, uh, I'm, Junie and I are both part of the Nutri Multi Faith Alliance. And um, we've addressed a number of issues in the past. We've addressed uh, climate change and caring for the earth and that kind of thing, <clears throat> the role of women. Um, I think more important, and we've, we've taken a look at this, um, I think the racial, um, racial injustice that we, that we experience. <clears throat> but I think one of the things we've decided, <clears throat> excuse me, more recently is what we need to do is really get to know one another more. So our focus this next year will be um, having people from our community and other faith communities visit each one of several of the faith, the worship, um, uh, places of worship. Mm -hmm. So in the spring, we're going to be, the Baha'i Temple is having, uh, having uh, 
a big celebration. I think it's in, is it uh, May or April? I can't remember, Junia. But anyway, they will, they're, they will be putting out a program inviting us and uh, inviting us all to come to church. And so I think that's a really a good beginning. <clears throat> and hopefully in the fall, um, maybe Temple Jeremiah will invite us to their Passover celebration. We will have them, we will have people here in our church for Thanksgiving and maybe in some other faith kind of um, uh, Christian faith for Christmas. So. so so imagine that you want to work on an issue, uh, housing or whatever it is. You say, well, wouldn't it be good if I could get, we could get somebody from Christchurch, somebody from the next <laughs> you know? A number of the other organizations are already working on these. And, and Gregory is certainly involved in anti-racism with a number of other communities. I was gonna say, I, I'll make sure everyone gets the email by tonight. I think it's on May 5th, but I'll, I promise to send it out. This burgeoning new group of uh, us and five other churches from here to Evanston. And we're just simply calling it, we are the racial justice group. Uh, there's gonna be uh, an event in early May. That's right. So, so I'm hoping I'm hoping we can sort of tie the new we're <laughs> hoping that we can tie the new Trier Faith Alliance into building a bigger bigger coalition because I think they're they're really, really interested in doing it. Absolutely. Um, so but, but what I was gonna say is imagine the difference between making a cold call to the to the office, say. So the person answering the office phone picks it up, versus I know somebody in that church. And I know they're interested in yeah, mm -hmm. something. And so that, all that's a completely different point. starting point with that's more like much more likely to be successful. Mm -hmm. right? yes. It's all based in life is about relationships, right? Simply getting these six and, churches together. The spirit of Saul Alinsky was in the room each time because we were just sharing our stories. What is going on in your church? We're doing the same thing. Right, exactly. Why don't we do it together? Exactly. exactly. That's what we're hoping to do. Is, mm -hmm. yeah. Along those lines, I'm really caught by the our relationship with Hakafa mm -hmm. and how it feels like it's sort of dropped under the radar screen and that should be they they chose not to have a building so that they could work on these types of things. And I would love to see that picked up again. Yeah. I, I don't agree. know if Faith Alliance is it's also they meet in our building, so we have a much sure. more yeah. We know that and much more it takes less energy to meet with people that you're very close to than it does to meet with people who are much more distant from you. So and we've done the mission per unit of energy, we're going to get much more positive relationships with these people who are close to us. So because it's in, the, in the current situation, it just looks like we're just getting income that we've got a rent. No, there's more. We we no, but we my point up. is that nobody understands it. Is there something deeper? Well. We've done two mission trips together. Yeah. Um, oh, see, I didn't to the, to the border. <clears throat> to the border was the recent one to minister to uh, migrants at the border, uh, and then before that, the to hurricane cleanup in Houston. We went to Puerto Rico. Uh, we went too. to Puerto Rico. Yeah. And That's that was a result of the relationship I think they had with one of the people from New Hampshire. So that predates me, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Where we went to, yeah. no, Puerto Rico was. So that'd be three mission trips. Yeah. But Katrina, oh. Katrina was also joined by a Muslim community. Right. right. Well, I oh, the two mission trips I know of had representatives from the Muslim Com Community Center in Morton Grove. Right. Right. And that's one that's the one we're involved with. And you know, you can't form a coalition with every house of worship on every issue. Mm -hmm. Right. So LGBTQ issues, you may not get support, and I'd be shocked if you do, from some evangelical churches, from Catholic churches, and from mosques. So you build coalitions of the moment <laughs> with who you can build coalitions with. And if a church has to sit out because it doesn't align with their values, it's fine. So we end. It's great. We'll catch you next time. You Amen. don't burn your bridge Amen. and say, well, you don't care about people. You say you do. No, you say, I honor, I honor our differences. Well, you find another issue that you can work with them on. Right, exactly. Amen. Right. Mm -hmm. Maybe over time you can educate them about other issues. Mm -hmm. You could only hope. Right? Yeah. In, in Lombard, there was a Muslim woman who joined our coalition on LGBTQ issues, especially trans issues. 
because she had a trans right. child. It makes a huge difference. Yeah. Now she was being on her own, not representing the mosque. But you never know where your allies are going to be found. Mm -hmm. um, so what was new for you in these seven weeks? Well, I liked your uh, deep dive into the constitutional issues with regard to the difference between uh, issues and supporting candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, that was very, very enlightening for me. Good. And, and, you know, that distinction. Mm -hmm. I was not aware of that before we had this yeah. series of meetings. And I, yeah, I was mention, kind of aware of it, but not yeah. the, the details. Yeah, there's a detail there, a lot of detail. <clears throat> really and I did mention last week that one reason the Johnson Amendment exists is without it, tax dollars would support the political speech and activities of nonprofits. Right. So it does, but it's very limited. So as we studied last week, uh, church or synagogue, mosque, Goodwara can use up to 20% of its activities for lobbying. And it can speak about any public issue, but it cannot endorse or oppose candidates or parties. So why is it tax dollars supporting that? Because not only do 501c3s not have to pay income taxes, but their donors can deduct from their income taxes an amount allowed by law. <laughs> um, from, and so that's so they get a break. That break is effect, effectively supporting the work of the institution. Supporting institution, what kind of work is it? Is it just charitable work, religious work, or is it political work? Well, some political work, again, politics defined as people together making decisions about what matters to us, that's allowed, but not supporting or opposing candidates or parties. It's not allowed. <clears throat> what else was new, exciting? Thinking justice versus charity was mm -hmm. a whole new concept for me. I really mm -hmm. used that framework. But I like to think of it as a spectrum with C to J, <laughs> number of letters between those two. And there's probably different ways you could look at various activities as closer to C or closer to J, but not necessarily zero one kind of decision mm -hmm. to make. So, Amen. Because it seems like We've had discussions where someone would say, well, this seems like justice to me. And someone would say, no, that's charity. <laughs> so there, there must be some gradient between the two as opposed to one or the other. Yeah, the question is whether something's justice or not. Is, is, is it aimed at structural systemic change in public policy? Well, is it aimed or does it hit? <laughs> well, sometimes you hit, yeah. sometimes you miss. Yeah, sometimes you miss. That's what but I that's, that's the point I was trying to make. Is but that's a substantially yeah. different purpose yeah. than helping individuals and families and so on. Where it becomes a little gray is the area of education. Does education change systems? Uh, maybe eventually. It doesn't change systems right away, right? If you want to change the educational system substantially, that is justice work. Mm -hmm. But education itself, you might change a mind, change a heart, but will that change actually lead to change in society? So right now, the Nutria English Department has taken a stand on um, teaching LGBTQ literature. And all last year, um, there were members of the community who came to school board meetings to protest and contest that. And so last May, we decided that as a department, our um, sophomore teachers um, would all teach two boys kissing. And there was a lot of pushback about that. And um, other you know, individually, certain teachers had been teaching that book, I think, for the past six years. But somehow, you know, the tides of the country um, have organized against such, oh, yeah, for sure. you know, you, we all know. And so uh, organizations outside of our own community mm -hmm. have been infiltrating. And um, we took a stand on that. And so 
this spring, this quarter, um, all the sophomore teachers will be teaching at in the level three will be teaching this book. But um, I I hope that you know that it will make a difference. I hope that it will make a difference. So that's for for all voices to be heard and recognized in 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 the curriculum that we teach. But the moment you said we took a stand, I said that's justice yeah. um, <laughs> because it sounds like you've got blowback. Yep. And we all agreed to do it together. Oh, great. Wow. Yeah. But that's education, though. And it's not, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> well, with the politics of the school board, they said, yeah, we're well, going to do school. this. And it's the school board the school. has endorsed no, school So, board has this endorsed. sounds like we have entered the area of policy, right? Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Oh, we're, we're really story. pleased and excited. <laughs> but wow. and we're also, you know, wide eyed. It, yeah, it, are you it, prepared it, for that? <laughs> we're having a meeting announced? on Wednesday yeah, about just, how we roll it out because yeah, there's going to say, yeah. has it been rolled out <laughs> yet? Has it been rolled? Strap in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't just put a banner up. We're the first school who did this because you'll never get any education done. You'll know, be mobs. <laughs> I'm, you know what I mean? I so are you, will this be put in context of all the other literature that's studied? I mean, I, I, I presume that there are other books that are read. Well, that, social issues. Yeah. 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 The sophomore curriculum um, does address the individual's role in society. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. That sounds very interesting. To me, uh, what, what, you, what you want to do is, is teach facts. This is, this is what... What the facts of history, this is what the facts of this and that, and so on. And you're not trying to talk anybody no. into believing that this is this is this is the way I need to believe and not that exactly. everybody else is a jerk. Uh, it, you know, it, it, you have to know the students have to be able to think critically about well, what are the facts and then what aren't the facts and what's and, and if you know what's what's all the garbage and be able to just to, to, mm -hmm. exactly to, yeah to tell the humans that, that's part of edu that's a big part of education right what's anybody against you know, reading that book together would have to be against letting kids read Huck Finn or To Kill a Mockingbird. Yeah. Right. So yeah. So it's interesting. They they talk about they're opposed to the sex scenes, but I said, well, what about in the Odyssey? What about in Catcher in the Rye? What about Romeo and Juliet? Romeo and Juliet. Exactly. <laughs> what we need is a diffusing yeah. thing like that. Yeah. Just yeah. a banner that just says something about studies in the human race. Oh, yeah. well, studies about the human race too. <laughs> So in these seven weeks, what did you find confounding? Like just your head is still like spinning or disturbing even or challenging? I think confounding would be how if one were to limit what the church took a stand on, how you would actually come to make that decision. Mm -hmm. Since there are so it seems to me there are many, many competing mm -hmm. issues. Yeah. And to pick one it's over really the other means. You're picking winners and losers, which is just back to power. And that, that then requires a lot of consideration. So that's really a big confounding thing for yeah. me is how you, how you actually, or, or how we even find out what we're doing now. We, we, I, I, sitting on a church council, don't know because we've not published what it is we're actually giving money to even. We don't, we don't have a list. <laughs> it's, it strikes me really odd that we would be having this conversation with that low level of knowledge of what we're actually doing in the church. You mean mission doing or mission giving? I Both. Mean, well, but that was neither. neither. I, I think that what's happening now with mission giving is um, every week in, in the messenger, there has been a little, uh, little um, blurb about each one of the organizations that we've well, been giving well, to. I, I understand that, but it seems to me that the church does know we've, we've given the money. I, 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 I don't have a list of who we've given the money to. I Well, that's available. Well, you can ask. Yeah, but it's not, I, I think it was published at one particular yes. point in time, but, but I, I will say that one of the things that's happened is that benevolence got moved into the church. And with benevolence, we had a very clear mission about what we gave to. Mm -hmm. And I don't yeah. think that that in that transition, 
to be fair, I don't think <coughs> that they have developed that same kind of structure yet. I think they're still working on it. And so I don't think it's, it's but I guess that makes my thing. point. This is very confounding. It is confounding. That, I'm, I'm we confounded. Need to, by that. We need to first have to, I would say, audit and assess what we're doing before we can decide what we're going to change. Yeah. And looking at these agencies we've been working with, either through mission giving or mission, mission doing, through the lens of charity and yeah. justice would also be another interesting. No, that's what I meant. You're right. You're, you're, right. The, whole, so, the whole idea here would be to figure out where we were on the spectrum between C and I, I would say that we have done both. There, there has been there are a number of agencies we've given that really promote justice, yeah. that actively promote justice, um, and there are a number of, you know, just charity organizations. Well, I, I would say probably more charity than yeah. justice, but certainly not there. That are strikes an analysis of that list strikes me as a good starting point for a congregational conversation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in fact, I mentioned last week that when Alex, Alex, Wiesendanger came to my church in Arlington Heights, one of the eye-opening exercises he had us do was visually put post-it notes on whiteboard, charity and justice. You know, what, what does your church do? Mm -hmm. And the charity side was full, the justice side, maybe one or two post-it mm -hmm. notes. So that's <clears throat> typical of churches. Sure. And there's a difference between giving money to a justice organization and going and participating in their activities to change public policy. They're happy to have your money. What they want though is you on the line at the meetings, going to legislators and so on. Um, paying someone else to do your lobbying for you. I think that's where we <laughs> tend to do that more than anything else. <laughs> that's, that's better than nothing, well, but it's, it's really life-giving to meet with a public official and say, will you support me? <laughs> <laughs> then your life has changed as well as hopefully the And so is there. Yeah. So another, another interesting question is, don't we have four pillars of focus? Yeah. And I can name three of them, but I can't name the four. Yeah. Jeff calls them threads, which I think is okay. a, threads that's a great whatever, image. Whatever. I like image. Okay. Uh, LGBTQ plus, Interfaith, environment, and anti-racism. Okay, it's the interfaith one that I was yeah. missing. Okay.